Hello everybody. Um, in this video we're going to be continuing our discussion of Gettier cases uh, by talking about two further conditions on knowledge that are often advocated and these are known as the sensitivity and the safety conditions on knowledge. Okay now the reason why these kinds of conditions come up is because um, there are Gettier cases, there are, you know, Gettier type counterexamples to knowledge being justified true belief, um, which don't have any false lemmas and yet still uh, seem to involve uh, lucky belief. Not lucky in the fortuitous sense, but lucky in a way where, where the actual method or procedure that produces the belief or the reasons for belief or the evidence for belief um, are scant and, and produce an instance of lucky belief where um, you're based on the method or procedure or reasons or evidence that you have available in virtue of which you form the belief, you're just as likely to form a false belief as you are a true belief. So um, if there is a method or procedure or mechanism or, or reasons or evidence whatsoever uh, which is just as likely to produce false belief as it is true belief. Uh, clearly, that's not a reliable method or procedure or reason or evidence. Um, and that's what, you know, that's why the belief in question is really lucky. Okay, now, but there's the problem. Um, so even though the no false lemmas case does, at least on the surface, appear to explain what's wrong with the Smith and Jones case, well, you know, the problem is that uh, Smith only believes the man who got the job has 10 coins in his pocket. He only believes that because he believes that Jones is the man that got the job, but that belief is false. Uh, Smith is the man that got the job. Um, so despite the fact that on the surface it seems to deal with that case fairly well, the problem is that there are other cases which don't involve false lemmas and yet still don't seem to count as knowledge. Okay, now, and if that's the case, if there are cases of justified true belief that don't have false lemmas but still don't count as knowledge, well that means that the no false lemmas condition isn't actually pulling uh, the weight that it needs to pull here. Uh, so the whole idea behind the no false lemmas condition, it's supposed to be a further individually necessary and then jointly sufficient condition on knowledge. But if there are cases of justified true belief that don't have any false lemmas that still uh, don't count as knowledge, well now that means that justification, truth, and belief, and no false lemmas, these are not jointly sufficient conditions for knowledge then. So uh, what we're in need of, if to the extent that we want a further condition on knowledge, if, if that's the best way forward we think to show um, how we can have knowledge or give a definition for knowledge, uh, then this fourth condition isn't going to work, okay? Now, and the various cases that um, philosophers and epistemologists point to, which are a little more complex, uh, that don't involve false lemmas, usually they involve things like um, uh, visual illusions, maybe even hallucinations and things like that, but you, the illusion or the hallucination actually matches up to what is there, all right? So, um, for example, one involves looking off into the, a field and seeming to see a sheep. So you form the belief there's a sheep in the field, but what you're actually looking at is a fake sheep, but there's a real sheep behind it. So your belief is justified on the basis of your visual evidence. It's true because there actually is a real sheep in the field. Um, and there's no false lemma here because it's not as if you're believing, uh, ah, I seem to she see a sheep and I happen, I, the sheep I'm looking at is a real sheep, you know, you don't need that. That's not really how we form beliefs on the basis of our visual evidence. Um, Bertrand Russell has a case where you look up at the clock and it reads noon, so you form the belief it is now noon. Well, the clock is broken, it's stuck on noon, but it also just happens to be the case uh, that you look up at the clock just right at the exact time. You know, you got really, really, really lucky here. But again, there's no false lemma. It's not as if you look up at the clock and say, it seems to me that the clock reads noon and that clock is not broken, that we don't believe that about clocks. Um, if I look at the clock to look at the time, I don't form beliefs about the time 
in virtue of believing that the clock is not broken. I just trust what the clock says. Okay, so this is an instance of lucky belief, which does not involve a false lemma. Okay, now uh, my favorite kind of case here is known as fake barn cases. So, uh, or are known as fake barn cases. So we're gonna take a little field trip today to Barn County, Michigan, which uh, if you can imagine, as you can guess, is known for its many beautiful barns. Okay, and in case you're wondering, there is no actual such place as Barn County. So if you drive to Western Michigan looking for it uh, and you don't find one, don't blame me. Um, just go visit a few of the many breweries in Western, Western Michigan and then it's, you know, worth the trip. Okay, now, um, so Barn County is known for its many beautiful barns, which just kind of speckle the landscape. But what a lot of people don't know is that most of the barns in Barn County are fake barns. They're actually just like two-dimensional barn facades where if you're looking at it straight on, you know, it looks, you know, like a real barn with the doors and the peak of the roof and everything. But if you were to get out of your car and walk out in this field here and, you know, try to walk around the barn, you would just see that it's like a flat canvas being held up by, an, you know, a, a big easel, basically. All right. So most of the barns in Barn County are like this. So as you're driving through Barn County, you look up at this barn, uh, you know, on the landscape and you just form this belief. You form the belief automatically there is a barn on the hill in, in virtue of your perception, in virtue of your visual evidence. Okay. So this is what you don't do. You, you don't form the belief there's a barn on the hill in virtue of your virtue in virtue of your visual perception and your belief that the barn you're looking at is real again that's typically not how we form beliefs on the basis of our uh, visual perceptions and our, our visual evidence okay so you form the belief there's a barn on the hill but here's what happens you just happen to look at one of the only real barns in all of barn county right so you get out of your car or you're driving down the road, you look out at the landscape, you form the belief there's a barn on the hill and your belief is true, your belief is true, but if you would have been looking in any other direction, your belief would have been false. Okay, so do you see why this involves an instance of lucky belief? This is an instance of lucky belief and here's why. The reason why it's an instance of lucky belief is you would have believed there is a barn on the hill even if there were no barn on the hill. So the fact that you just happened to be looking at, the fact that you just happened to be looking at the one real barn or one of the only real barns in all of Barn County, whereas if you would have looked in any other direction, you still would have believed there was a barn on the hill even though your belief would have been false, that is why it is an instance of luck. So the method that you're using, the procedure that you're using in this circumstance would have been, it would have been just as likely, in, in fact, it would have been more likely that you would have had a false belief as a true belief. Now, why would it have been more likely that your belief would have been false? Because most of the barns are fake. Most of the barns are two-dimensional barn facades. They're not real barns. So using this procedure, using this method, um, not only is it the case that it's just as likely that you're at least just as likely that your belief would have been false, it's more likely that your belief would have been false due to the fact that most of the barns are fake. So the fact that you just happened to look at the one real barn, that's why this doesn't count as knowledge. Okay. Now, and given that this is where we get the sensitivity condition on knowledge okay so the sensitivity condition or at least one formulation of it is this a given belief that p once again where p is any proposition whatsoever is sensitive just in case had p been false you would not have believed that p okay so a given belief that p is sensitive just in case had p been false had it have been the case that P was false, you would not have believed that P, you know, given or via the method or procedure that you used. One formulation says you would not have easily, would not have as easily believed that P, right? But the whole idea here is if your belief is sensitive, 
it means you wouldn't have believed it had the belief been false. So if you would have believed it, regardless of whether or not the belief were false, that means that your belief is insensitive. So your belief that there is a barn on the hill is insensitive. Why? Because even if the barn you were looking at were fake, you still would have believed there was a barn on the hill. Again, if you would have looked at in any other direction, really, you would have formed a false belief rather than a true belief. So your belief that there is a barn on the hill is insensitive precisely because it doesn't meet that condition. Okay? Now, and this is the problem with, you know, the fake sheep. Uh, even if there were no real sheep in the field, you still would have believed there was. So your belief that there's a sheep in the field is insensitive. Um, if you looked up at the clock right at noon, uh, even though the clock is broken, you still would have believed it was noon. But if you would have looked up at the clock five minutes later or five minutes earlier, your belief would have been false. Okay, so the, the procedure or method um, which it really accidentally produces a true belief, but it's much more likely to produce a false belief. So that's why it's not reliable. That's why it doesn't count as knowledge. Okay. Now, and uh, the clear advantage here to sensitivity is that the sensitivity condition can also accommodate false lemmas cases. Okay. So the benefit here is that since the sensitivity condition can incorporate false lemmas cases, it takes care of all those cases where there's a false lemma, but that's not really the problem. The problem is not that there's a false lemma. The fact, uh, the problem is that there's an insensitive instance of belief here. So the sensitivity condition can account for all of those cases plus more cases. So, aha, this seems to be uh, indicating that we're heading in the right direction here. Okay, so let's go back to the Smith and Jones case. So Smith's belief that the man who got the job has 10 coins in his pocket is also insensitive. So again, the problem is not that there's a false lemma, it's that it's an instance of insensitive belief. Well, why is it an instance of insensitive belief? Whoops, let me go back. Um, it's an instance of insensitive belief precisely because he would have believed the man who got the job has 10 coins in his pocket, even if that belief were false. So remember, uh, the descriptive phrase, the man who got the job, uh, actually refers to Smith. And again, he just also circumstantially happens to have the right number of coins in his pocket. But if he would have had one less coin in his pocket, his belief would have been false. If he would have had one more coin in his pocket, his belief would have been false. If he would have put a different pair of pants on, his belief would have been false. If he would have had no coins in his pocket, his belief would have been false. So on and so on and so on and so on and so on. If he would have worn a kilt to the interview as opposed to pants, his belief would have been false. So the number of conditions in which he would have believed it, if it, even if it were false, is pretty high, which is exactly why his belief is lucky, okay? So the sensitivity condition then accounts for the Smith and Jones case, as well as these other cases, the fake sheep case, the fake clock case, and the fake barn case, okay? So that all sounds well and good, but, um, the sensitivity condition has some pretty significant problems with it, okay? So uh, this is an example given by philosopher Saul Kripke. Let's, let's amend the fake barn case a little bit. So we're going to amend the fake barn case to say this. Suppose in Barn County, all the real barns are painted red and all the fake barns, all the, the two-dimensional barn facades are painted green, all right? So all real barns are red and all fake barns are green. Okay, so when you're driving through Barn County, this is what you see. That is just lovely. So you're driving through Barn County, you look off into the distance, and you see this, and you form the belief there is a red barn on the hill. And I, I know that looked kind of flat there, but hey, I had to search for images that were labeled for reuse on Google. <laughs> so just let's just say it's it's the top of the hill. All right. So uh, in virtue of your, your visual perception, in virtue of your visual evidence, you form the belief there is a red barn on the hill, all right? Now, your belief that there is a red barn on the hill is sensitive. Why? Because all the real barns are painted red. 
So if the if the barn you were looking at were a fake barn, the supposed barn you were looking at were a fake barn, you wouldn't have seemed to see a red barn. You would have seemed to see a green barn. So you wouldn't have formed the belief there is a red barn on the hill unless that belief were true, right? You would not have formed the belief there is a red barn on the hill unless that belief were actually true. Um, if the barn were fake, if it was a two-dimensional barn facade, it would have been painted green. It would have been painted a completely different color. Hence, you never would have formed that belief that there is a red barn on the hill. Okay, and here we're assuming you don't have like inverted spectrum disorder with respect to colors or anything like that. You know, we're operating on the assumption that your your powers of observation um, are working correctly for the most part. Okay, now, but uh, suppose you would have seen this. So uh, that's painted green, which means that's not a real barn. Believe it or not, that's a two-dimensional barn facade. Okay, so that's not a real barn. Now, but if you looked off in the distance and you saw this, there, and you believed there is a barn on the hill, your belief would have been false. Okay, and hence it wouldn't count as knowledge. All right, so you would believe there is a barn on the hill, regardless of the color of the barn. If the barn is red, you're going to believe there's a barn on the hill. If it's a two-dimensional barn facade that's painted green, you're going to believe there's a barn on the hill. Okay, so... Here's the issue. Your belief that there is a red barn on the hill is justified, true, and sensitive, meaning according to the sensitivity condition, it counts as knowledge. So you're good there. So once again, if the barn would have been painted a different color, if the fake barn would have been painted green, or if the barn, supposed barn were painted green, it would have been fake. Hence, you wouldn't have believed there was a red barn on the hill. Okay, so your belief that there is a red barn on the hill is justified, true, and sensitive, which if justification, truth, belief, and sensitivity, if these are jointly sufficient conditions uh, for knowledge, that means you know there is a red barn on the hill. However, your belief that there is a barn on the hill is insensitive, right? So if you seem to see a red barn, it's true that there's a barn, right? But if you seem to see a green barn, it's false that there's a barn. So your belief that there is a red barn is sensitive and true and justified, and hence it counts as knowledge. However, your belief that there is a barn on the hill is insensitive, Regardless of whether the barn were red or green, you would have believed it anyways. So your belief that there's a red barn is sensitive. Your belief that there is a barn is insensitive, okay? But what does that mean? That means according to the sensitivity condition, you know that there's a red barn on the hill, but you don't know there's a barn on the hill. So your belief that there is a red barn is sensitive. Your belief that there is a barn is insensitive. So according to the sensitivity condition, you know there's a barn on the hill, but you don't, oh, I'm sorry, you know there's a red barn on the hill, according to the sensitivity condition, but you don't know there's a barn on the hill. So your belief that there's a red barn is justified, true, and sensitive. Your belief that there's a barn is justified true and insensitive. So you know there's a red barn on the hill, but you don't know there's a barn on the hill. Now, how many of you are asking, well, how can you know there's a red barn without knowing that there's a barn? Yeah, that's the million dollar question here, okay? That's what seems to be puzzling about the sensitivity condition. Now, to put it more technically, um, this is the problem with the sensitivity condition. Sensitivity is incompatible with epistemic closure. Okay, so we talked about epistemic closure in, in the introduction to epistemology video. So if you haven't watched that video yet, you might want to stop right now and go back and watch that video. Okay, so how does uh, epistemic closure apply to the barn case? Okay, so um, you know there is a red barn on the hill according to the sensitivity condition. So your belief that there is a barn on, or I'm sorry, your belief that there is a red barn on the hill is justified, true, and sensitive, so that is why it counts as knowledge. 
Now, and it also seems that, you know, there being a red barn on the hill implies that there is a barn on the hill. I mean, obviously there being a barn on the hill is a necessary condition for there being a red barn on the hill, and you know that. You know that there being a red barn on the hill implies that there is a barn on the hill. Now, so according to epistemic closure, if you know that there is a red barn on the hill, and you know that there being a red barn on the hill implies that there is a barn on the hill, According to epistemic closure, you would know there is a barn on the hill, right? Okay, now, but the sensitivity condition denies that. So once again, your belief that there's a red barn is sensitive. Your belief that there is a barn is insensitive. So you know there's a red barn on the hill, but you don't know there's a barn on the hill, okay? Now, so the issue here is what do you think sounds more reasonable, the sensitivity condition or epistemic closure? Okay, now, and I mentioned this in the introduction to epistemology video, uh, there are plenty of philosophers who reject uh, the principle of epistemic closure. Not all epistemologists think that um, knowledge is closed under known entailment in this kind of way. Um, and without going too far into it, um, here's at least one reason why uh, epistemic closure might fail. So um, since knowledge requires belief since knowledge requires belief um i can believe a conditional statement uh without believing the actual consequent of the conditional so there's a difference between believing if p then q so you can believe the conditional if p then q is a true conditional okay you can believe if p then q why uh because the antecedent of the conditional is enough to make that, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, the antecedent of the conditional being false is enough to make the conditional statement true. So if you believe P is false and you believe if P then Q, I mean, that's compatible. So you can believe the conditional if P then Q is true. Why? Because you believe P is false without having any beliefs whatsoever about Q. Okay, so you can technically believe um, if there's a red barn on the hill, then there's a barn on the hill without, according to the argument, believing that there is a barn on the hill. But since knowledge requires belief, if I can believe a conditional without believing the consequence of the conditional, then epistemic closure seems to fail for that kind of reason. Okay, now um, that's kind of a layman's terms explanation here, and I probably butchered it a little bit, but um, that's one of the reasons why um, some epistemologists and philosophers would say that epistemic closure fails, okay? Now, but if you think epistemic closure sounds reasonable, or maybe we could say, well, sometimes knowledge is closed under known entailment, and then other times it's not closed under known entailment. I mean, if you want to make restricted cases for epistemic closure rather than unrestricted cases for epistemic closure, be my guest. Okay, but all that to say, um, if you think epistemic closure sounds reasonable, especially in this, you know, red barn case, uh, then this is a problem for sensitivity. Okay, now, so uh, the other condition, safety, uh, is different. Now, and it sounds as if it's saying the exact same thing as uh, sensitivity, but it's saying something completely different, right? So it's not, um, for example, well, the technical terminology is this. So um, it involves what's called the idea that, that what's known as contraposition in logic is not valid for counterfactuals. Uh, so yeah, I'm running out of time, so just look that up, all right? Um, if you're interested in looking it up, uh, philosopher Ernest Sosa has, um, he specifies reasons why sensitivity and safety are not the same thing, even though they sound as though they're the same thing. Okay, now, um, so the sensitivity condition says that you're given, you're given belief that P is sensitive, uh, just in case had P been false, you wouldn't have believed it. Well, safety says this, a given belief that P is safe, just in case... In the nearest possible worlds in which one believes that P, P is true. So that is different. So sensitivity says, had P been false, the individual would not have believed it. Uh, safety says, if you believe it, then it's true. 
Now, that doesn't mean that your believing it is what makes it true. You know, this isn't um, some form of subjective relativism or something like that, right? We're not saying, well, you're believing it is what actually makes it true. We're just saying in the nearest possible world in which you believe it, that belief is actually true. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, fake barn case here. Now, suppose this is the case. Um, suppose had you turned two degrees to the left, you would have been looking at a barn facade, right? And, you know, if you largely, if you would have been looking in any other direction than the direction you actually looked in, you would have been looking at a fake barn. You would have been looking at a barn facade, hence your belief would have been false, okay? Now, so if we understand a possible world um, just for stipulation as a way the world could have been, right? So there is a possible world in which instead of looking directly where you were at a real barn, you would have looked two degrees to the left and you would have been looking at a fake barn, okay? Now, but a world in which you turned two degrees to the left, that's pretty close to the actual world. So in this possible world, everything else is the same, except for the fact you turn two de degrees to the left. That world is pretty close to the actual world. Now, and since there is a pretty close possible world, in which you believe that there's a barn on the hill, but this belief is false, that means your belief that there is a barn on the hill is unsafe, and hence it does not count as knowledge. Okay? Now, what about more sort of radical skeptical scenarios? Well, what about this? What about the world where there's an evil demon, right? A world in which you believe that you have hands, but you actually don't, and you're being deceived by a demon. Okay? So is a world in which you don't have hands, but you seem to because there's this all-powerful demon tricking you into thinking that you have hands. What do you think? Do you think that's pretty close to the actual world? I mean, is a world where there's a, an all-powerful demon convincing you you have hands when you actually don't, is that pretty close to a world in which you turn two degrees to the left, or does that seem to be pretty radically far away? Right? That seems to be a really far away possible world, a world in which there are all powerful demons that are, you know, deceiving all of our, or getting us to think that all of our ordinary belief uh, and all that sort of stuff, you know, these external world skeptic kind of scenarios. That world seems to be radically far away. Okay, so your belief that you have hands seems to be safe because the closest worlds in which you believe it and it's not true, these seem to be really, 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 really far away. Okay. Now, um, this is really important though, with both sensitivity and safety, but particularly with safety. Um, you don't need to know that your beliefs are safe in order for them to count. They just have to actually be safe, okay? So um, this is what sensitivity and safety have in common with each other. Sensitivity and safety are both externalist conditions on knowledge. So with sensitivity, I don't need to know or even have any idea that my beliefs are sensitive in order for them to be sensitive. Likewise with safety. I don't need to know that my beliefs are safe. I don't need to know that in the nearest possible worlds in which I believe it, it turns out to be true. I don't need to know about which worlds are further off and so on and so on and so forth. I don't need to know any of that. My beliefs just have to be safe or my beliefs just have to be sensitive. Okay, now I've only got about one minute, but the issue here, which we're not going to go into, but it's something to think about. Um, how do we determine which worlds are close and which worlds are farther away? How close? So how close does a possible world have to be in order for your belief to be safe? Um, so safety seems to be a relatively vague concept here. I mean, closeness can come in degrees, right? <laughs> so I'm closer than I was before. But how close, exactly how close does a world have to be in order for the beliefs you have in those worlds to be safe? Right, that's part of the problem here. Okay, so I know this was a lot of material. Um, I know it's a bit more heady than the previous videos, but hey, it's all still fun. So um, as always, if you have any questions on this, uh, don't hesitate to email me. Uh, and again, I hope you found this enriching and somewhat enjoyable under the circumstances.